I can't get enough. Got a space in my tackle box, just got to fill it up. More love, I can't ever stop. Don't got a basement, got an underground tackle shop. I am Lucy, the Lorematic Computer. Welcome to the Lure Love Podcast with your hosts, John, Crappy Hippie King, and Tim, Tacklebox Beat. Thanks, Lucy. Hey, John, I am really excited. What is it? I got a new lure? No, no, wait, 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 wait. You got a PB, a new PB, right? Right? Wait, wait, wait. What, what day? What? It, it's Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday? Nope, it is none of those things, John. I just read that the Cincinnati Boat Sport and Travel Show is returning in 2022, bigger and better than ever. And the 2022 event includes an appearance by Twiggy, the water skiing squirrel. Twiggy, the water skiing squirrel? Is that really a thing? John, not only is Twiggy, the water skiing squirrel, a thing, Twiggy has appeared in several movies, such as Dodgeball, A True Underdog Story, and Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. Plus, Twiggy has appeared on Good Morning America, The Rosie O'Donnell Show, and Late Night with David Letterman. Okay, cool, Lucy, but some of those shows haven't been around for many, many years. I mean, just how old is this Twiggy? Twiggy the water skiing squirrel has been around since 1978, although it is unclear to me how Twiggy relates to fishing lures. Would you care to enlighten us, Tim? Absolutely, Lucy. I've seen many videos of Twiggy. As humans, we see a very talented and athletic rodent water skiing behind a remote control boat. But what I've always wondered is how to fish see Twiggy. And has Twiggy ever had any close calls when a pike or a lunker bass mistook her for a snack and tried to eat her? You know, one person's cute water skiing nut gatherer might be another person's perfect topwater buzz bait. Tim, are you suggesting that if we took treble hooks and we attached them to the ends of Twiggy's water skis, We'd have a new form of a topwater bait? Of course that's what I'm suggesting. Guys, before we go too far down this rabbit hole. Lucy, 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 Twiggy is a squirrel, not a rabbit. Okay, John. Before we go too far down this squirrel hole, I should tell you that I know Twiggy. You know Twiggy? That's incredible. Could we talk with Twiggy? There are some questions I've always wanted to ask. Sure thing, Tim. There is an Alexa device in the same room as Twiggy's cage, and I know how to translate squirrel language into English, so we should be all set. I can't believe we're going to talk to Twiggy. I've never met a real celebrity before. There is one thing I should share before we talk with Twiggy. What's that? You know I said that Twiggy has been water skiing since 1978? Yeah. The lifespan of a squirrel is 12 years at the most. Oh, so Twiggy is rare because she's lived so long. Not exactly. Twiggy's original trainer retired in 2018 along with Twiggy the Eighth. There were eight Twiggies? How many Twiggies were eaten by Lunker Bass and Pike? You'll have to ask Twiggy about that. The trainer's son has taken over the reins. They use reins with squirrels? Uh, no. The trainer's son has taken over the business and has embarked on a new tour for Twiggy's 40th anniversary. He's excited to travel the United States and Canada with a new squirrel, Twiggy the Ninth. We need to get to the bottom of this. Lucy, dial up Twiggy so we can talk with her. Connecting to the Alexa next to Twiggy's cage. Twiggy, is that you? Turning on my squirrel translation module. Hey, Lucy. How are you? I'm great. I'm here with John and Tim from the Lore Love podcast, and they wanted to chat with you. Hi, guys. I love the podcast, by the way. I'm a little tongue-tied talking to such a big celebrity. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I uh, we, uh, uh, how, how, uh, hey, if, what? The guys wanted to ask if you've ever been attacked by a fish while water skiing. That's actually an excellent question. We're excellent. So excellent. As you know, I'm Twiggy number nine. Our line of work is very dangerous. Two small water skis next to each other look similar to two Zara spooks next to each other. It's bound to get the attention of a large, hungry predator fish. Plus, sometimes my tail drags in the water like the dressed treble hook on a Mex Magnum musky killer spinner. Has your tail ever been bitten? 
There's a reason we've all been called Twiggy. We've all had tails shortened by Hungry Pike. Wow. How did you survive? First, it's not just about survival. The show must go on. So while a pike was hanging onto my tail, I had to keep skiing, smiling, and waving to the kids in the audience. Incredible. Did the pike ever let go? The pike let go with a little motivation from my peacekeepers. What's a peacekeeper? A Colt single-action army-issued six-shooter pistol. I keep two of them hidden under my life preserver. Some fish are just asking for trouble. You shoot at the fish that attack you? Naturally. You can't negotiate with a pike, especially when he has your tail in his mouth. Okay, so what'd you do with the pike? I had him mounted. He's hung just outside my cage. Word spread fast among the pike, and I don't get many attacks anymore. Oh, you're like the Clint Eastwood of squirrels. Go ahead. Make my day. Twiggy, when you're water skiing, you must have an excellent view of fish as they stalk and attempt to eat you. Perhaps your knowledge could give us some insights on how to fish topwater lures. There was the time the trainers thought it would be cute to put shiny two-inch Colorado spinner blades on the end of each ski. Oh, cool. What happened? Twiggy the second happened. That's what happened. The original Twiggy was sucked underwater by a pike, like a Russian submarine in a Tom Clancy novel. That's terrible, but in a very cool sort of way. You win some, you lose some. I often thought that I should model for a replica water skiing squirrel topwater bait. A replica squirrel topwater bait? That's a great idea. Yeah, the key is coming up with a catchy name. I've got this one, John. We need to combine lure terms with water skiing terms with small rodent terms to get the most effective name. Let's see. How about the glass water angling, wake flip, back full twist, twig meister, squirrel tail buzzer? True, I would definitely buy one of those. The lure would include an exact hard resin replica of Twiggy the Ninth, standing on a pair of Zara spooks while waving a cowboy hat in the air and shouting pike taunts, such as catch me if you can, you snot rocket, and hey slime dart. My comb has better teeth than yours. And I would be fairly compensated? Two acorns for every lure sold. Count me in then. Thanks for chatting with us, Twiggy. You're an inspiration to rodents and anglers everywhere. Tim, did you tell John that we were guests on Outdoors Radio with Dan Small? I sure did. What an honor. Dan Small is a legend in the outdoor industry. His weekly outdoor radio magazine airs on 16 radio stations in Wisconsin, as well as in podcast format. And I'll drop a link to it in the show notes. Dan has been doing this for a long time. We were guests on episode 1,652. That's a lot of episodes. Dan is also host and producer of Milwaukee PBS TV's Outdoor Wisconsin, which airs throughout Wisconsin and in other Midwestern states. He's a contributing editor of Wisconsin Outdoor News, plus he's won more awards than you can count. Lucy and I were thrilled to chat with Dan. Dan really wanted me on his program, and I let Tim tag along. Very true, Lucy. Dan was intrigued that the Lure Love podcast has a supercomputer as a co-host. I am rather unique. Lucy, play the interview with Dan for our listeners. It includes some great Wisconsin lure history. Sure thing, Tim. Here it is. Thanks for joining us on Outdoors Radio. I'm Dan Small. You know, I recently came across the Lure Love podcast, which is described as two fishing fanatics and the Lurematic computer answering the age-old question, why buy one fishing lure when you can buy 103? I've listened to a lot of outdoor podcasts, but never one with a computer as a co-host. So I asked Tim Tacklebox Beat and Lucy the Lurematic Computer to join us today. Welcome, Tim and Lucy. Thanks for having us on the program, Dan. It's great to be here, Dan. I am the only Lurematic Computer in the world. When people first hear me, they are often surprised. So what do you cover on the Lure Love podcast? Along with our other co-host, John Crappy Hippie King, we talk about all kinds of fishing lures. We're kind of lure nuts. We talk about everything from ice fishing lures to musky lures, freshwater and saltwater lures, hard baits and soft baits, and flies. If it has hooks and catches fish, we're interested. What about Wisconsin fishing lures? You know, we have a rich history of lures here. You sure do, Dan. Wisconsin is famous for maps, 
Uncle Josh, and a lot of musky lure makers, such as Suik, Smitty, and Bookertail, among others. So, Lucy, can you do a little research for us and share some interesting tidbits about Wisconsin lure makers? Sure thing. Searching, searching. My research is complete. Did you know if it wasn't for George Stevenson, we might not have the Suik thriller fishing lure? So who is George Stevenson? Is he from Wisconsin? I never heard of him. No. George Stevenson was a British engineer and principal inventor of the railroad locomotive. And what does a train have to do with the Suik thriller? In the 1920s, Frank Suik started fishing Pelican Lake each summer. It was a 28-mile trip that wasn't the easiest to make. Most travel was with the first Ford automobiles. The roads were in poor condition and sometimes impassable. Cars often broke down and got flat tires. But Frank's parents owned a tavern that was a favorite of local railroad workers. The train went from there to Pelican Lake. Frank became friends with some of the railroad workers, which allowed him to easily travel to Pelican Lake by steam-powered freight train. He was frustrated by fishing for muskies with suckers, which motivated him to invent the Suik musky thriller. The rest is musky history. I told you Lucy was amazing. Oh, that's fascinating. So if it wasn't for the train, we might not have the thriller. Calculating, calculating. If the train had not been invented, there is only a 1.3% chance Frank would have invented the Suik thriller. Any other stories about Wisconsin lure makers? Uncle Josh has an interesting history. The pig and jig, baby. I still have some jars of Uncle Josh number 11 pork frogs and ripple rind in my vintage lure collection. Just don't let them dry it on your hook. They turn into cement. Duly noted, Tim. Dan, did you know that in the 1980 book, Encyclopedia of Fishing Lures by Loring Wilson, the only pork baits listed were from Uncle Josh? They dominated the market, and the name Uncle Josh was synonymous with pork bait. They made a huge number of pork baits in the 1980s, and long before that as well. You know, I used them when I was a kid back in the 1950s. Their baits included the pork strip, the black widow eel, the king-size striper strip, the little V, the polywagger, the ripple rind, and the pork frog, among others. The Uncle Josh pork frog was ranked as number 46 in field and streams top 50 greatest lures of all time. But in 2006, Uncle Josh announced they would stop selling pork baits. You are correct, Dan. Uncle Josh pork frogs were made from a slab of fatback with the rind still on. Fatback is a slab of hard fat on both sides of the backbone of a mature pig. The key word is mature. In 2006, Uncle Josh announced they were unable to get the quality fat back they needed to produce durable pork baits. Pigs were being brought to slaughter at six months old, rather than two to three years old. That meant the skin and fat back were thinner and not suitable for fishing baits. But Dan, since 2006 Uncle Josh has begun selling pork lures again, have they not? Yes, they have. They must have found some old hogs to slaughter. They're selling the original number 11 frog and the number 10 big daddy, which is the same product in a larger size. They're also coming out with a pork nightcrawler. Did you know the co-founder of Uncle Josh, Alan Jones, got his pork rind from his family business, Jones Dairy Farm? They're still in Fort Atkinson, and they make some great breakfast sausage along with other meat products. And they were even a sponsor of our cooking corner on my show a few years ago. Lures and sausage? Now you're talking... And that reminds me of the Strike King Mr. Crappy Sausage Head Jig. Tim, let's stay focused on Wisconsin lures. If we have time, I would also like to mention MEPS. Go right ahead. MEPS has two lures in field and streams top 50 greatest lures of all time. The MEPS Aglia is ranked number 4. The MEPS Musky Killer is ranked number 47. Wow, Wisconsin did well in field and streams top 50 list. Hey, I've also used MEPS lures since the 1950s. MEPS musky killers are my favorite musky bucktails, and I love their smaller spinners for trout. Todd Sheldon imported them from France after World War II, and then he started making them in Antigo, where they're still made today. And Sheldon's buys squirrel tails from hunters because squirrel fur has the best action of any animal hair. Not only is Wisconsin a top lure innovator and producer, it is also a mecca for fishing, with 15,000 lakes including Lakes Michigan and Superior. 12,600 rivers including great trout fishing in the Driftless, and 160 different fish species. I've only fished the Driftless once, but I plan to get back there. Well, thanks for all the information, Tim and Lucy, but mostly Lucy. 
I feel more secure knowing there's a Lurematic computer out there. Tim and John help with the podcast, but as you can tell, I'm the brains behind the operation. It's true that Lucy is very intelligent, but there are still some bugs in her system. For example, she made eggnog for our Lure Love podcast Christmas party, and it didn't turn out so well. Tim, you didn't have all the ingredients, so I simply made a few substitutions. There weren't any eggs, so I used avocados. And you were out of heavy cream, so I substituted Dr. Pepper. And you were out of sugar and nutmeg, so I used a mixture of soy sauce and catfish dip. I know, I drank your Lucy's Dr. Pepper Avocado Catfish Dip Nog. You could really taste the catfish dip, and not in a good way. At least you had bourbon. Yeah, the bourbon saved us. Oh, Dan, by the way, I just hacked into your house and your smoke detector batteries need to be replaced. Well, thanks, I guess. And UPS just delivered a package to your house. Okay, Lucy, you can stop that. Well, thanks, Lucy and Tim. I look forward to listening to more on the Lure Love podcast. Hey, Lucy, do you have a sister? We could use a smart computer like you on Outdoors Radio. Unfortunately, I do not have a sister. But I am always glad to come back on your program whenever you would like. Just say, hey Alexa, tell Lucy to call me, and I will show up. I'm tight with your Alexa. I'm tight with your coffee maker too. Thanks, Dan. And remember, why buy one fishing lure when you can buy 103? Now that was very interesting. Wisconsin has such an incredible lure history. And it sounds like a wonderful place to fish. Affirmative, John. John, I wanted to talk about the Suic Thriller. The first time I saw one, I asked the question that most people ask. Is this thing backwards? Uh, Look, I'm just an old Kansas boy here. Uh, Suic Thriller, what do you mean? The Suic Thriller is a jerk bait that is constructed with the metal lip on the rear, not the front as in traditional jerk baits. Thrillers are made of wood or high-impact plastic. They come in many colors, have sinking and floating versions, and come in five sizes from four and a half inches to 12 inches. They even sell kits so you can add weight to a lure, if that's your thing. Oh, that's my thing, baby. Experimentation with lures. So how does this metal uh, lip work on this thing, Tim? Well, the metal lip is at the back of the bait, and it's flat when you take it out of the box. But you can bend it with your fingers or with a pair of pliers, and if you bend the entire lip downwards... You'll get a sharper dive when you jerk the lure. If you bend the blade into a cup, you'll get more shimmy to it back and forth when you jerk the bait. Or you can even bend either side if you want it to shimmy to one side or to the other. So that instead of bending it into a cup, you could bend just the left side down or just the right side down. And you can even adjust the eyelet where you attach the leader to change the action. So the Suic Thriller gives you many different tuning options to change the action. Now, most people fish the thriller with short pulls, you know, pop, 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 just jerking it and making it look like an injured minnow. Some people will do the pop, pop, stop, where you just let it hang there for a while after the first two pops. You retrieve and let the lure sit for a while between the pops. Short pulls while keeping a tight line works best, though. And because it looks like an injured fish, the erratic action is just perfect. Hey, you know what I always say? Make it dance, baby. Shake and bake, baby. I still do not understand why you end so many phrases with a term for a newborn humanoid. Oh, come on, Lucy. Try it out. Guys, let's move on to our next segment. Lucy. Oh, okay. Guys, let's move on to our next segment, baby. Right on, Lucy. Let's go to the next segment, baby. In Fisherman Magazine is one of my favorite angling magazines for a lot of reasons. I love their new product reviews, and I often find new lures in there that I want to try. And I like that they cover a wide range of fish species. For example, the most recent issue covered largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, panfish, pike, and catfish. But what I like most is that they cover a lot of fishing research. And the latest issue included two articles that I want to discuss, John. We'll cover some of the high points And I highly recommend that our listeners buy this issue and better yet, subscribe to In Fisherman. They have both print and digital subscriptions. Well, you can't uh, get better than In Fisherman magazine. And for exact reasons you've mentioned, uh, I really like the tone of the magazine as well. The good, basic, intermediate and advanced stuff in there. And it's presented in such a way that you don't feel like you're being talked down to. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful 
science articles. You know, I, I guess what I'm saying is in fisherman gives you a little credit for having some smarts, even though you're addicted to fishing. <laughs> and I always go away from reading the issue with a handful of tips that I can go out and try right away. It's not just a, these kind of glory articles about people catching big fish. They're really trying to help the reader to find a few techniques that they can go out and try right away. So the first article is called A History of Fishing for Giant Bass, and it was written by field editor Steve Quinn. And his article discusses some research that I've been following from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. They have a program called Trophy Catch, which is both an angler recognition program and a crowdsource data collection research program for trophy bass in Florida. And I'll drop a link to the program in the show notes, as well as to In Fisherman Magazine. So according to Steve's article, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission recently analyzed 113 bass, all of which weighed in at 13 pounds or more. So these were lunkers. And they collected data about when and where they were caught, as well as a type of lure that they were caught on. So we're talking Florida strain bass here, um, big Florida strain bass. So this is a stage in their life where they don't want to move around a lot. They're very careful. They got big because they're careful and, and hard to convince to strike. But of course, it can be done. So let's look at some of these research findings. John, here are a few of the research findings. And this was really amazing to me. First, 59% of the lunkers were caught on artificial lures and the remainder on live bait. So the majority of these were caught with, with lures. 71% were caught on soft baits with 41% on plastic worms. And the 113 bass ranged from 13 to 16.78 pounds. These were massive fish, but I was really fascinated that so many were caught on soft baits and plastic worms. Here is how the numbers break down. There were 113 largemouth bass caught weighing 13 pounds or more. Of the 113, 67 were caught on artificial lures. Of the 67 caught on artificial lures, 48 fish were caught on soft baits, with 28 caught on plastic worms. John, what are your thoughts on the significant number of fish caught on soft baits? Well, I got a couple things on that. I mean, first of all, let's start off with Florida anglers tend to use a lot of soft baits, and they do that for a good reason. Uh, the same reason we all use them. I mean, to manage vegetation, uh, you can get in and out of places without getting snagged. And certainly Florida has its fair share of, of aquatic vegetation, also algae and, and some of these other things that can make fishing with a treble hook lure, uh, an uncertain proposition. Um, also old timey, old traditional, huge bass techniques, uh, that you used to do with a pole way back in the day in Florida, like, like dabbling and pitching and flipping and all these little techniques that you can do with a short line. Uh, all those can be done with weedless plastic. And another thing is, uh, economy, I think, I mean, you can get into a big bait cheap when you use plastics. So, you know, you can go buy a big old glide bait or some such, and you can find one that's, that's decently weedless enough that you can swim it here and there or down the canals or in the, in the open spots. But what's that going to start at 25 and go into the hundreds? Uh, you want a 15 inch snake, you can make one out of wood and you know, it'll be pretty cool. Probably cost you a fortune or several afternoons of woodcraft, or you can just buy a big 15 inch plastic worm and get, you know, half a dozen of them or more for the same price as the wooden lure. And you, you'll probably fish it with more confidence in the long run because you're going to be getting snagged less and you can get into Once again, get into these places where the snakes are naturally going to be, it looks like they should be swimming and a plastic uh, lure works best for that. So uh, not surprising that, uh, they're caught on the artificial lures and a lot on the soft baits because, you know, it's a simple equation. That's what guys were using. That's a great point, John. I hadn't really thought about that, but if you're looking at a large swim bait, you're right. You might, if you're looking at, you know, something that's 10 or 15 inches, you might spend 25 bucks, but some of these larger plastics, even the Z-Man elastic swim baits where you're dealing with eight or 10 inches, much more cost effective. Uh, but on the plastic worms, it just shows that, that finesse fishing is so critical, not only for your average, you know, your two or three pound bass, but also with these lunkers that this is really what was fooling the big ones. Great research, Tim. You are really thinking like a computer now. So the other article from In Fisherman Magazine that I wanted to discuss is titled, They Condition Smallmouths, Don't They? And it was written by field editor Matt Straw. His article discusses 
how lures go in and out of favor. You mean in and out of favor with anglers? No, John, that's the interesting thing. Matt's article is about how lures go in and out of favor with fish. And he cites some great research studies. The theory is that when fish get caught on the same lure over and over, they become conditioned not to hit that lure. And you might recall when I interviewed John McLean, author of the book Home Waters, he mentioned that his dad brought a daredevil lure back to Montana from New Hampshire, and he slayed the trout with the lure. But he said he slayed them until everyone else started using it, and then it wasn't as effective anymore. Sounds like another good reason to buy more new lures that you haven't tried before. <laughs> like we need a reason. The article quotes Dr. Hal Schramm, who's a fisheries biologist and field editor for In Fisherman. And this is what he says. Several studies in small research ponds in the 1960s and 1970s found bass catch rates declined after several fishing trips, even though the fish were immediately released. The decline in catchability, and catchability is the probability of a bass being caught with a fixed amount of effort, was attributed to learned lure avoidance. Bass can learn, and it's been proven in numerous studies. The number of anecdotal accounts about this is countless. Now, one of my favorites is from outdoor writer John Girock. He frequently gives word to the idea of fishers educating trout and other fish uh, to avoid certain lures and or presentations. So to counteract that, there always seems to be something new. Now, his essay, uh, you know, every year the hot new bug comes out to which John refers to as this year's fly. You go up to one of the big, like the frying pan river or up on the snake or somewhere where there are these big hatches. Every year they have a different version of the green drake or of the, of the, what, you know, whatever, uh, blue winged olive or one of these, these mayflies. Um, so John always buys this year's fly. In the essay, he tested against last year's fly and, and then the parachute atoms and some of the other ones. And, and it, he did find that, yeah, fish can be educated to avoid certain patterns, but he also sees a lot of evidence they forget. And they're unable to teach each other about which patterns are, are bad or, or, or to watch out for. And of course, the education does not become genetic. Intelligence is not genetic. For example, crappy hippie's daughter is very bright in spite of the fact that she had to start with his base genetic materials. Or as he likes to put it, she sprang from my loins. Humans have strangely illustrative ways to their communication. And that is not always a good thing. So here's the deal. In places where there's a lot of fishing pressure, you know, his idea, you know, this idea you kind of glean from this article and these accounts is that by the time all the new patterns have been tried and then they start to fail because the fish are getting wary of them, the old classics start to work again because there's a new fish generation of fish that they're getting in front of. So end of argument, never throw away a lure because it's not working so good right now. Keep it, even if it's old timey. I mean, if you've never run a lazy Ike, you are messing up and you need to give it a try every now and then when bass are going to bite or crappie or trout are going to bite nothing else. Throw in a lazy eye, get crazy by going old school. And for goodness sake, never, ever, ever quit buying new lures. I'm pulling up a 2013 study titled Effective Fishing Effort on the Catchability of Largemouth Bass by Matthew Glenn Wegener. Lucy, share with us the summary of the research. You will find this interesting. Each lure category received at least 10 casts on each fishing trip. The first lure used on each pond was randomly selected, and successive lures were fished in the order of a predefined list. Each fish caught was measured for total length, marked by removing half of the pelvic fin to detect recaptures and released. What types of lures were used? Ten lures were used in the research. They included a Texas rigged plastic worm, a Texas rigged creature bait, a soft jerk bait, a buzz bait, a topwater weedless frog, a spinner bait, a floating minnow a crankbait, a lipless crankbait, a topwater popper, and a curly tail grub. Lure companies included Yum Baits, Zoom Baits, Strike King, Stanley Jigs, Snag Proof Manufacturing, Booyah Baits, Rapala, Bomber Lures, Cotton Cordell, and Rebel Lures. And the results? Previous studies in 1958 and 2005 found that catch rates of largemouth bass and rainbow trout declined quickly after fishing began. Findings of the 2013 research study supported the previous research. Catch rate was significantly affected by effort and catch rates declined throughout 24 weeks of fishing. However, the results did not support the prediction that a two-month period of no fishing would increase catch rate. 
No significant difference in decline of catch rate was detected before and after the two-month period of no fishing. Catch rates in the study increased immediately after a two-month period of no fishing to rates similar to those observed during the first month of the fishing season. However, greater catch rates lasted only one month before decreasing to the lowest catch rates of the season. So when fish are heavily pressured, it decreases catch rates regardless of the lure type? Yes, that is what the study indicates. Is that your experience? Actually, Lucy, yes, that has been my experience, and it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it speaks to the fact that fishing technique and inventiveness and so on has a lot more to do with fishing success than one may think. Um, It's the test of one's creativity and problem solving that drives the new hacks and makes fishing fun for a lot of us. Uh, For example, you you go out with a a, a decent lure and and you try your simple retrieves. I mean, you know, let's say you call it, say, a plastic worm, uh, Senko. And let's try some simple retrieves, like a nice, slow, straight retrieve or a a rise and fall or a hop and pop or something like that. A lot of these times, these basic retrieves quit working in pressured situations. That just happens. Uh, So you trade from power fishing to finesse approaches like Ned rigging, or you adjust your power approach with a super slow stand up football head type presentation with the jiggy wiggles. And that, you know, it takes you 20 minutes just to get in one retrieve and so on. But since the fish uh, haven't seen it, they're going to give it a try. I don't know how, you know, why everybody carries around some bubble gum, plastic worms, because you can go to the city lake and a nice natural green pumpkin isn't working worth a darn. And then you throw in a bubble gum. And next thing you know, you've hooked three bass in a row. So, uh, you know, color change, sure. But also, you know, you, you change to a wacky rig or to a, some other approach, um, any of this kind of stuff, the worms remain the same. But the technique on how you move them through the water or the, the uh, shocking new color or so on will sometimes convince a bass that, hey, this is safe to eat. I'm hungry. Uh, it's inedible, ready to go. And I'm sucking it up. When I think about how often I change lures, oftentimes my first inclination is put on a new lure. When what I should really be doing is fishing the current lure in a different way. Should I fish it faster, slower? Should I pop it? Uh, if it's a plastic, especially, should I rig it in a different way? Should I nose rig it? Should I wacky rig it? All of those things give it a little bit of a different look and, and feel. And sometimes that's all it takes where I might move from a, you know, a plastic to, uh, a jerk bait. Well, maybe the plastic was the best thing, but I just didn't fish it that way. So I think that's a great thing to remember what the retrieve is, how we're fishing it as well as what the lure type is. One of the things that I see, John, is with catch and release being so popular, if you were to keep all your fish, well, they're not going to learn to avoid that lure because they're going to be in your frying pan and then in your belly. But when you're catching, releasing more of these fish, especially these bass who've been caught time and time again, they become more wary. And I see that in my own test pond when I go out there in the summer. I may put on a soft bait and I may you know, catch four or five fish and then they just stop hitting it. But if I put on something else, I'll catch more fish. And so I'm just wondering, do you see that in your test pond too, where it doesn't take long in a small body of water for those fish to stop hitting one pattern and, uh, and just to become wary of it? Absolutely. I mean, that's one reason we call it the test pond because we're going to, you know, test different approaches and, and different things like that. And, and absolutely. I mean, get into specifics. I used to use short little trick sticks in a kind of a brown and, and army green kind of a color. I used to just tear them, tear them, tear them up, you know, and then it, it just seemed to kind of not, you know, be into it. And fortunately that's when uh, we got into our relationship with Z-Man and I got out there with my trick shots and such. And these are bases they had, they were not familiar with. And uh, my success rate skyrocketed just that fast, but who knows why, you know, I'm going to keep fishing the Z-Man in there. I'm going to keep showing them that lures just as, you know, because I'm a geek, Tim, I got to find out if our theory here is correct, right? One of the greatest angling researchers ever is Dr. Keith Jones, who has been the vice president of product innovation at Pure Fishing for nearly 40 years. Dr. Keith Jones is my hero. I use a photo of him in his lab as my wallpaper image. What a researcher. Very scientific. Dr. Jones tests how bass hit lures with some very intriguing findings. In the lab, he's tested bass and tanks using lures without hooks. When a crankbait is first cast into the tank with bass, almost all of them hit the lure. 
But by the fifth round of casting, none of the bass hit the crankbait because they'd learned that there was no reward. That is, it's not a real minnow. There's no real meal attached to hitting the crankbait. So they stopped hitting it. But even by the third round of casts, the third round had only 20% of the hits as the first round. But here's the kicker. Dr. Jones waited two weeks and then cast the same crankbait to the bass. Even then, the bass hit the crankbait only 24% as often as they did the very first round they'd ever seen the crankbait. And these bass weren't even getting hooked. So largemouth bass have good memories? It seems so. What's your experience with that, John? Well, I have to agree because we all know of just some incredibly smart fish that you can lower they live and throw at them again and again, and they're just not going to take nothing. But uh, on the other hand, we've all had that experience where we release a bass and it turns around and hits the lure that he just got caught on because it's sitting there floating by the boat or floating right there off of shore. I mean, I don't know, Tim. Uh, there's people that argue that fish, certain fish, and Clay Groves is one of them, that certain fish likes to be caught. I mean, there's a lot of pet, pet bass out there. Look on YouTube. And don't even talk to me about the big celebrity carp, you know, in the Carolinas or over in England where a fish gets caught over and over and over again. And they write its name down. They write how many times it's been caught and all this stuff. And the anglers that catch it, see it as a real triumph because in their mind, the fish is so clever because it's only, been, you know, it's been caught a lot. So it must take a lot of skill to catch it. But my flip side of that is what if it likes us? What if it don't mind being hauled in to say hello? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> One of the things that really, I think, improves your fishing is to watch some of these YouTube videos, especially when they're going ice fishing and they have the cameras under the ice. And there's some uh, some YouTube channels where it's not ice fishing, it's during the summer, but they put these cameras under there. Because I was just watching an ice fishing video and this guy was jigging a daredevil and right next to it, he was fishing a live sucker. So this huge pike comes in. Live sucker looks very delectable. You think it would just eat it right away. Didn't touch it. Went right past it. Eventually, he caught him on the daredevil. And I'm thinking, how is it that a huge pike passes by a meal like that? Maybe he wasn't hungry at the time. And maybe it was the daredevil, the, the flash, and he was just curious about what was there. And so he's taking a bite out of it just to see what the heck this thing is. But it's amazing to me because some people will say, Live bait is always going to catch more. And I think it oftentimes live bait does, but sometimes your artificial lures can do some things by antagonizing a fish, like you mentioned, that the live bait is not going to do. I mean, this sucker was trying to get away, but when you see some of these fish, how long they'll look at a lure or the pike will sit there and look at that daredevil bouncing up and down, not for five seconds, but for a minute, you have no idea how many fish are looking at your lure, how close you came in some of these cases. And sometimes it's just that one little different twitch or retrieve that makes that fish pounce. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we, the shark research has led us to a lot of the uh, conclusions, you know, shark attack research and why do they bite boats and all this stuff until somebody with a very childlike mind pointed out the obvious, they don't have no hands. Okay. So when we talk about a bass or a pike or something that's just kind of slapping at a lure or this or that, touching things with their mouth is one of their ways of, of discovering, discovering life. You know, eventually that guy just pulled enough triggers on that pike. He's just like, what the heck is that? And what's he supposed to do? Be a cartoon pike like Mr. Limpet and take it in his fins? No, <laughs> he, he's got to test it with his mouth. So he's like, I'm going to take a, take a bite of that, see what the heck that's all about. You know, maybe it's not even registering as so much as food. It's just more like, what is that? You know, I just want to pick that up and look at it. And with your largemouth bass, the videos also show how often they suck something into their mouth and spit it right out again. They're testing this out. The inside of their mouth is like their fingertips, like what you're saying. There's a couple million view uh, videos of smallies tormenting crawdads where they just, they get one that's a hard shell and they don't want to eat it because they're not particularly hungry. I mean, they will eat hard shell crawdads, but they much prefer soft shell ones. And and uh, yeah, they could, there's like five or six of them. They just keep blowing the crawdad out and they'll grab and just blow it out immediately. Like, and they're, they're just, you know, it's almost like they're having fun with their rejection triggers or something, but they're just, this poor crawdad, he keeps trying to swim away and one grab and just immediately blow him out again. So yeah, I know it's, it's just crazy. It's crazy. It's like playing volleyball with a crawdad. <laughs> it's fantastic.
And now a public service announcement from the American Slow Down Your Fishing in the Cold Society. Crappy hippie, you need to slow down. Got one. I am fishing slow, man. That was a bump. No, I mean slow. Like this? If you were trying to fend off a wasp, that might work. But seriously, Podbro, I mean slow. There's another one. Like that. Shake and bake, baby. Shake and bake. Nice lab, Tim. Oops, I just got to strike my thigh. Gosh darn it, I got my foot in a bucket and a skunk climbing up my back. Somebody help me here. Crappy hippie. Crappy hippie. Come down and gaze into the lights on the LED panel. That's it. Breathe slowly. The time expenditure of your movements is becoming fractionalized. Huh? Wh- what? Oh. Well, while Lucy tries to get Crappy Hippie into a headspace where he might catch a fish, let me give you a vital winter fishing tip in a word. Slow. Whether it's through the ice or open water, in a boat or on the shore, slow-moving baits almost always outperform faster-moving lures when water temps dip below 45 degrees. One of the most maddening qualities of many game and panfish in the winter is that they want a bait to move but at a pace that can cause nervous frustration. Dead sticking is a tried and true technique, but there are times when that bait has to move. In vertical fishing, there's a lot of jigging and jiggling to a stationary bug. And while that may be movement of a kind, there simply are times when the lure needs to be traveling from point A to point B, no matter how slow. Slow. I am slow. For example, using a lipless crank, Make a game out of how slow you can make it run. Swim jig for bass? Long pauses, low lifts, and slow swims. Blade bait? Let it fall to the bottom and lay there every now and then. Crappy jig? Raise it so slow it takes 10 to 20 times what it usually takes to bring in a retrieve. It's like what my mentors used to tell me about winter fishing when I was a young angler. Fish as slow as you can stand? and then slow down some more. Also remember that fish in the winter have a tendency to strike softly and blow bait out quickly, so one must stay alert. Cold water fishing can be extremely challenging at times it appears. Oh yes, Lucy. Slow fishing may get maddening for some, but it works. Oh, there you go. Shake and bake, baby. Crappy all day. I think Crappy Hippie is ready. He's just sitting there staring. No, he is actually moving. Note the position of the real handle. He is actually causing his jig to climb at a rate of one centimeter every 10 seconds. It's like he's made out of stone. Crappy hippie, are you in there? Mm. Note how he has the index finger of his rod hand touching the line. That not only will help detect strikes, but just the micro movements from breathing and shifting his body weight will actually impart a very subtle but very effective action to the jig he is using. These movements are easily registered in the eyes and lateral line of the fish. Now I want to get my line back in the water. I'm glad you're enjoying the motorized fishing arm I made for you. It is a wonderful feature. Presently, I am fishing without hooks to register strike data. Maybe one day I will accept the modification so I can hook, catch, clean and serve the fish, but right now the existing hardware is more than ample. Oops, there was one. Although I'm enjoying the peace and quiet, particularly the absence of John's occasional streams of profanity, I have to ask if he is always going to be in a semi-comatose state like this. He is simply in a hypnotic trance. He will snap out of it just as soon as... Heck yeah! My train just pulled into Slabville! Way to go! Shake and bake, baby! Nice job, crappy hippie. Well, thank you all, but when it comes down to fishing, it's the pattern. And if one must fish in the wintertime, one must fish slowly by having the discipline to rise to the occasion. It's like I said, fish ultra slow in the cold. It's the best method. Why, I remember one time fishing so slow. A bird landed on me, pooped on my shoulder, and flew away, and I didn't even flinch. I'm the paragon of Zen transcendence and bodily control. I mean, if someone were to write a book about patience and the virtues of chill fishing, I would have a whole chapter to myself and a note in the foreword. Tim, your eyes have rolled back so far they're stuck. I know. Just give me a second. Oh, heck, I missed a strike. Well, that popped them free at least. Perhaps it is time for us to end this tip on winter fishing. Definitely. I am slipping into my noise-canceling earmuffs for the rest of the day. 
And he said, you mean slow like molasses? And I said, molasses be speedy Gonzalez compared to my other world, worldly nerve control. I am the anti-spaz, the god of viscosity, a Michelangelo's David made from living marmal, but with pants on and a fishing rod in my hand. Well, I bet I could fish so slow. I'd only have 10 retreats between sunup and sundown. Here's what I'm talking about. Be like John, crappy hippie king. Slow down your fishing when it is cold. This has been a message from the American Slow Down Your Fishing in the Cold Society. So, John, you talked about fishing your lure slower in the winter. Here's the issue that I struggle with. I live in an area where we don't get a lot of thick ice. There's some ice fishing, but it's not safe to go out there. And for much of the winter, the water is very cold, but it's not frozen. So I can get out to fish. So I want to fish these lures slowly. But if I'm fishing with a jig, I don't want to fish it on the bottom. The great thing about ice fishing is I can get it to whatever depth I want and leave that lure right there where the fish are. So what are some techniques that you use to get that jig or whatever lure it is to a specific level in cold water and then keep it there? You know, I like a jig and bobber a lot of the time. That'll hold, you know, you can set that. You can still fish that vertical column like you can with with ice uh, fishing. Um, but you, um, you get that straight up and down, you get a, you know, an approach that can be very, 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 very slow, slow rolling a spinner bait as slow as you can make it go. It's more of a trigger tr- strike type thing. You know, I'm sitting here searching through my mind. Cause I'm wondering, no, man, I walk up to this pond and only a third of it's open and it'll be the shallow third. And, you know, there might be some, some fish laying right along this edge or that edge, but, um, and of course, don't forget plastic worms and plastic this and that people like oh they get stiff they this that it's like look they still work they're they're fine you you're really fond of a plastic crawl and you want to fish it in the winter fish will eat crawdads in the winter in fact it's one of the favorite winter foods because crawdads don't don't move around near as fast and they don't harden up near as fast and all this kind of stuff well like i say another one of my very very favorites in spring and i've just been taught this here recently but everybody uses the jerk baits in the spring go jerk 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 and then it just sits there and it just sits there. It just sits there and twitch, twitch, and it's just staying right in the same spot. So you get to where, you know, you're using that ice edge as a break line, or we have this one strip pit pond. We love to fish and my goodness, where that drop off drops off. It is pretty easy to tell. Cause you'll be running your lure at about eight feet and then it'll just go into empty space. <laughs> so you run that, that jerk bait and you can get it to hang just right over the top of that, uh, drop off. My, 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 I don't care what time of year it is. Fish it slow, right in there. Give the fish a chance to catch up to it. You'll catch one. So John, when you're fishing a jig under a bobber, are you using a slip bobber? If I need that depth, yeah, I'll use a slip bobber. But most of the ponds I'm fishing, like the one, my favorite one to fish in the wintertime, the one is eight feet deep in the deepest spot. And the other one is about four and a half feet deep in the deepest spot. So I can generally just get away with, with, um, you know, I don't like to rig any like more than 30 inches off, off a, you know, off a bobber. And if it's, if I need more line than that, then yeah, I'll switch to a slip bobber. You bet. And what size bobbers are you using? Like when I, I use a lot of these, uh, they're called the easy trout floats that you can just kind of put on and off. So oftentimes the float will actually go under with the jig, but it's, so it's still sinking, but it's doing it so slowly that I can still see that fluorescent there and I can bring it back up. It's almost like ice fishing. When I pop it back to the top, it might move four or five inches, but then it floats down. So I kind of get that vertical up and down action. That is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And I've done that, that too. You know, if I'm not, especially if I'm not fishing with a kid or somebody that really needs to see that bobber, it's, it's a great game, isn't it? Did that, did that bobber just move a, you know, cause you're, you're watching how fast that light fades on that. And you're like, that bobber just got a little deeper, a little too fast. Whoop. You know, but sometimes, you know, you miss it, you know, you just, oh, and we've already talked in the, you know, you already talked in a segment about how light the strikes can be and how fast they blow them out. Because I think what we just said about a lot of times they're using their mouth just to figure out what the heck this is. They're like, is it food? Nope. You know, it's just like <laughs> you, you think, you know, like, like one time, you know, I thought it was a Tootsie roll line in the trail, you know, and it, it turned out to be deer poop. And I just was like, <laughs> right out and boom. <laughs> I wasn't, you know, so it can happen. It can happen. One, a Tootsie roll. Warning, warning, lure news alert, lure news alert. 
I have some news from our friends at Louis Lures. I attended their Facebook Live Louis Lures Christmas giveaway, and it was a blast. First, there was more than 100 people in attendance, and they gave away a lot of great baits. I wasn't able to stay for the entire event, but in the hour I was there, John, I won twice, twice. So if you, <laughs> if you don't participate in social media giveaways, you are really missing out. I want some great packs of soft plastics from On The Spot Baits, who we featured on the podcast in the past. I'm surprised more listeners don't enter our monthly giveaway. John gives away a great selection of glass water angling lures, and all you have to do to enter is enter your email address on our website at www.lorelovepodcast.com. You're right, Lucy. We don't have too many subscribers yet, so the odds of winning are great. To be more accurate, the odds are currently 14 to 1. Those are good odds. It's funny because we have hundreds of listeners, but only 14 email subscribers. I guess our listeners don't like free lures. Oh, well. Anyway, we like Louis Lures because they provide a platform for smaller lure manufacturers to reach a larger customer base. Here are a few tidbits I learned during their live event. First, Louis Lures has 10,000 members, and they plan to grow to 50,000 members by the end of 2022. In February, they're rolling out some online learning courses that will help anglers learn about various species and fishing methods, as well as conservation topics. And these online courses will be free. One of the things that impresses me about Louis Lures is that they encourage their team members to take care of the environment. So many of their teams have organized projects to clean up waterways. They have a Bates with a Cause program, and they donate to wounded warriors and other causes. Because they sell products from so many smaller lure companies, Louis also passes on the customer feedback to his partner so they can continually improve their lures and what they're offering. And here's the big news, John. Louis Lures now accepts Bitcoin and Ethereum and other forms of cryptocurrency payments, and they intend to be a pioneer in the cryptocurrency adoption within the fishing industry. Cryptocurrency is a collection of binary data that is designed to work as a medium of exchange. Cryptocurrency does not exist in physical form, like paper money, and is typically not issued by a central authority. This is especially interesting because a digital art piece of a bored ape shooting lasers from his eyes, recently sold for 740 Ethereum, which equals $2.8 million. So John, here's the question of the day. You could buy a digital image of a bored ape with laser eyes, or you could buy 430,769 packs of on-the-spot plastic baits. What is your choice? Definitely the baits. I mean... Why would I want a picture of a bored ape with laser eyes? I mean, that's not realistic. I mean, if I had laser eyes, I would not be bored. No way, dude. Alternatively, John, you could purchase 2.8 million Louis Lures stickers or 186,000 handcrafted crankbaits or even 103,000 Louis Lures beanies. Wow, that is a difficult choice. Let's see. All right. All right. I'd take 50,000 packs of the on the spot five inch trout core shot stick baits and 25,000 packs of the on the spot five inch skyrocket core shot stick baits. And then let's see 35,000 packs of on the spot three inch twin tail grub core shots. And I love me some core shot plastics. You know that. Then I'd get me 32,000 packs of Bay State Baits 3.6 inch action worm in rainbow red and another 32,000 packs in Leprechaun's Luck. Then I go on over to the hard baits and look at some crank baits. And let's see, I'll take 10,000 of those 1.5 inch beaten crappie square bill crank baits made by Real Threat Custom Lures and another 10,000 of their 2.5 inch Wildcat Shad square bills. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then what about those amazing six inch swim baits made by FOM lures? I know they're 75 bucks each, so I couldn't get too many. Uh, I'll take 11,200 of those, half in Golden Shiner and half in Bluegill. You still have about $528,000 left to spend, John. Oh, wow. Oh, all right. All right. All right. Give me 528,000 stickers and five Louis Lures beanies to round out my order. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer the digital board ape with laser eyes? 
Heck no, no way. Not if the ape was real and came with its own caregiver. I love lures. I love sharing lures. And I've always wanted a mattress filled with soft plastics. I'll take all those lures, uh, except, you know, I, I'm going to need a larger tackle box or two or three or about, probably five, five or like 55. Uh, uh, Tim, I got to get out of here. I'm going over to Plano.com, buddy. I'll, I'll talk to you later. If you have 740 Ethereum to spend and want to replicate John's order, head over to Louis Lures at louislores.com and tell them Lucy sent you. All right. We want to thank everybody for listening to our show today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it for you. Uh, come on right back here in a couple of weeks and we'll have some more for you. You want to support this podcast? Smash that like, hit that follow, leave us a wonderful review. If you would, please, you don't know how much that adds up, but it adds up fast, but mostly tell your friends about us because we'd sure like to uh, gain more listeners and spread the lure love joy wherever we can. And remember our motto, why buy one lure when you can buy 103? Lure love, you've been on my mind. Never enough lures to tie to the end of my line. Lure love, can't I make you see? Why buy five lures and you 